we haven't met yet, Yoletta, <laughs> but it's my pleasure to introduce you. Um, this year, as we announced earlier, we are adding a sponsor to this session. And if I might, just a little history. I got a call, phone call from John Ryan one day, and he said, I got a phone call from Yoletta McWilliams, and she, she would like the FDI, FDIC to be a sponsor of the conference. Well, I will tell you, when John calls, things happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and quite honestly, things came together maybe faster, Todd Vermillier, than I've ever seen things happen in a regulatory world. It was fabulous. And we had good dialogue and talked a lot about what this would involve going forward. And it happened very, very quickly. So John, thank you for being the instigator of that. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, Yelena was confirmed on May 24th, 2018, as the 21st chairman of the FDIC. Prior to her current role, she was executive vice president, chief legal officer, and corporate secretary for Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati. Also in Loretta's district. Oh, yeah, yeah. So two wins there. Okay. But we're not keeping track, right? <laughs> she graduated from the University of California at Berkeley with a Bachelor of Science degree in political science and earned her law, law degree from the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. I actually talked with some of your uh, employees here, regional directors, and they're pretty impressed. So I think that's really amazing. They're supposed to say they're so, okay, and they're supposed okay, So they did exactly what you wanted. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Yolanda. Thank you. So I have to tell you, when um, I, I came to the helm of the FDIC, I thought there's this great conference that I've been following for years when I was on the Senate Banking Committee, and for some reason, we're not there. So I called John, and it happened. So thank you, John. I'm, I'm extremely grateful, uh, President Bullard. I'm, I'm extremely grateful that things just happen at the speed of light, and, and I am thrilled and honored and humbled to be here, and uh, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, and it strikes me, uh, interesting that I got a slot between three billion people and dinner reception. So I, I have to deliver. Um, as I walked into this great edifice, I, I saw the mo mo mantra of Central to America's economy. And I thought that my speech tonight actually fits into that theme very perfectly uh, because um, trust in public uh, institutions is crucial to America's economy. It's crucial to what we do. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about the steps we're going to take at the FDIC to strengthen that trust between the, our agency, other regulators, the public, and banks through transparency and accountability. I have been in my role as chairman of the FDIC for just about four months now. And I have to tell you, I have cherished um, and, uh, and honored every day of it. Uh, my journey to the FDIC did not begin as, as some people would imagine. Uh, uh, it began as a child in the former Yugoslavia, in a system of government that was very different than our current system. In the United States, uh, it's a system that was more opaque than transparent and where those in government uh, and in power could not be trusted to do the right thing and you could not challenge them. Today, I'm blessed to live and work in a system of government that is open, democratic, and built upon public trust. We as Americans entrust in our government the power to lead. In return, we expect the government to be fair and open and to work to advance the public good. When we trust the, the system, we fall a part of it. It is our government. On the other hand, distrust breaks down relationships, whether it is between a business entity and its customers, manager and employee, or government and citizens. When taken to the extreme, it can lead to the breakdown of our institutions. Like any asset, trust must be earned and then preserved. In my view, the best way to maintain a trusting relationship is to be accessible, understandable, and responsive, to provide your stakeholders with information and means to hold you accountable. And it is these principles that form the foundation for a new initiative at the FDIC that we're calling Trust Through Transparency. In recent years, there have been signs of declining trust in public institutions. Surveys by the Pew Research Center show public trust in government at near historic lows. Over the past decade, roughly 20% of Americans said they could trust the federal government to do what is right always or most of the time. Fixing the broken trust felt by the other 80% of Americans will not be easy, but like any solution, it begins with recognizing that trust is a two-way street. 
Abraham Lincoln is credited with saying, the people, when rightly and fully trusted, will return the trust. Among the positive outcomes of transparency and accountability are increased public participation, more stable economic growth, positive development, and less conflict. With those benefits in mind, there is no better place to promote trust through transparency than the FDIC. Sorry, the Fed. <laughs> Since 1933, the FDIC has protected depositors with the core mission of maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system, a duty that would be impossible to fulfill without public trust. Trust in the FDIC as insurer has kept consumers from fleeing with their bank deposits at the first sign of trouble, including during the recent financial crisis. In our 85-year history, which includes more than 3,500 bank failures, depositors have never lost a penny of their insured money. And we have learned that when depositors understand how the FDIC operates and how their deposits are protect protected, trust in deposit insurance grows. Trust in the FDIC as a supervisor means that banks are confident that our examination process is fair and free of outside influence. The trust between bank and examiner is unlikely to survive a process that is opaque, poorly communicated, and riddled with inconsistencies. On the other hand, open and responsive communication with our supervised institutions helps them understand what is expected so they can decide how best to comply given their unique circumstances. This is especially important in the case of smaller community banks. If the chief compliance officer is also the CFO, the chief loan officer, and a bank teller in her spare time, she needs to be able to allocate her unlimited time effectively. Understanding clearly what the institution's supervisory obligations are makes that possible. As a receiver of failed bank, the trust in the FDIC encourages participants in fair asset sales that return maximum value to the private sector as quickly as possible. Beyond individual institutions, transparency is pivotal to maintaining trust in the safety and soundness of the entire banking system. It helps to bridge information gaps and allow an analyst and investors to monitor the buildup of risk and limit it to accept acceptable levels through market discipline. During times of economic or financial stress, transparency becomes even more important as the FDIC undertakes stronger and more visible actions to deal with problem banks and resolve failed banks. The stronger the actions, the greater the need to be transparent, not only with respect to what action is being undertaken, but who will benefit, who will pay for it, how will it affect banks and consumers, and why it is the best possible course. Communications that are absent, misunderstood, or non-responsive will only serve to heighten misperceptions that undermine trust and the recovery process. One last point regarding the importance of transparency to the FDIC mission. Because we are an independent agency, the FDIC is keenly aware of the need for transparency and accountability to the public, and that we must work even harder to promote the public's trust. Recognizing the vital role of trust in our ability to accomplish our mission, the FDIC currently strives to provide useful information, data, and resources to help banks, consumers, and the public understand what the FDIC does. For instance, we currently provide information on how we conduct examinations, process applications, calculate deposit insurance assessment, and resolve failed banks. As chairman, I want to build upon this foundation by promoting consistency across business areas and fostering a deeper culture of openness at the FDIC. It's a first important step in that process. Today, I'm pleased to announce our Trust Through Transparency initiative that unites each business or area across the FDIC behind the goals of being accessible, understandable, responsive, and accountable. Over the coming months, you will see progress in a number of areas, a few of which I will share with you today, before dinner. <laughs> first, we launched a new section of our public website where we will publish new FDIC performance metrics. Quantifiable measurements of performance, such as turnaround times for examinations and applications, including de novo applications, will be regularly published, providing transparency to the banking industry and the public on our performance as an agency. We will also provide metrics on our call center usage and response times. The site also contains guidelines and decisions related to appeals of material supervisory determinations and deposit insurance assessments. By making these metrics available for comment and criticism by the public, we're holding ourselves public account accountable to high standards. In the same place on our website, you will find policies and procedures for how we conduct our work, 
including extensive details on how we process and evaluate applications, including de novo applications. You will also find information on how case managers and examiners implement the risk-focused supervision program. And we will add to this section over time. The FDIC also will reevaluate the proper balance between protecting conf confidential information and providing public access. The agency has already begun a systematic review of the information it has deemed confidential, which includes reviewing our FOIA process and how we apply exemptions. A related effort of mine is a nationwide listening tour, which I recently launched. I intend to meet with stakeholders, including many of the banks we regulate their customers and consumers in each of the 50 states. My goal is to reverse the longstanding trend of having those affected by our regulations come to Washington to be heard. It is long overdue that we come to them instead. To promote real trust, we cannot simply make data available publish performance measures, and consider the job complete. That is not transparency or accountability. Instead, we must strive to be accessible to financial institutions, consumers, our fellow regulators, and the general public, understandable to most audiences and responsive to new ideas and demands. We designed the Trust Through Transparency Initiative to do just that. The FDIC will provide more data and make it easier to find. We will provide more information that anyone, not just technical experts, can understand. We will solicit and respond to public feedback. We will provide real quantifiable performance measures and set goals to surpass them. I believe this initiative will accomplish the goals of true transparency and accountability, and I am proud that this transparency is my first public initiative as chairman of the FDIC. My ultimate hope is that the Trust Through Transparency Initiative will strengthen the bond of trust between consumers, banks, and the FDIC, while best positioning the FDIC to fulfill its mission of maintaining stability and confidence in the nation's financial system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, interestingly, and John, I'll give you in the CSBS credit, one of the reasons this conference is held in the middle of the country is so it's not in Washington, and I think very much aligned in our thinking in that regard. So great, and, and welcome to the regulatory world.